Thank, thank you very much. I don't know if this is going to work. Uh, we need to set this up a little bit. I don't want to be blocking people's views as I talk. All right, can we? Hi, I can see you now. Great. Well, thank you very much, Wallace, for the great introduction. And Wallace, of course, is the president of the University of Maryland and doing a fantastic job. Let's give Wallace Lowe a big round of applause. You know, what you don't know about Wallace is that uh, he's an immigrant to the United States, actually born, in, or actually born in China, but actually ended up in, was it Chile or Peru? And came to the United States in high school age, did not speak a word of English, really and um, went so successful in terms of going to Yale and eventually Dean of the University of Washington Law School, uh, I think Provost at a variety of universities and now uh, the President of the University of Maryland and doing a fantastic job. I thought I was speaking after dinner so I'm not really quite ready for this, a uh, little bit unprepared here. But first of all, I want to thank uh, Hai Pei Shu for, the inter uh, for inviting me uh, to this uh, conference, this convention, and for the great work that he's doing at the United Chinese Americans. And I want to thank all the officers and all the uh, directors of that organization uh, for putting on an outstanding conference. Uh, the topics that you've, that you've had so far and will continue to have tomorrow are so relevant to the issues facing our community, and the list of speakers from all across the country is very, very impressive, and you're tackling some very, very tough issues. You know, Chinese Americans and Asian Americans, whether we're first generation or fourth generation, are facing many challenges, some new and some long-standing. To know how we should respond and where we should go from here, it's important to always reflect on our individual and our collective journeys to and while here in America. So let me start with our family journey. In the late 1880s, my grandfather came to America and worked as a servant for a family in Olympia, Washington, the state capital, in a house about a mile from the state capital. He swept floors, washed dishes, and helped cook meals in exchange for English lessons. And like everyone else in our family, my grandfather worked and studied hard, and eventually, like many of the early Chinese, went back to China, got married, had children, came back to the United States to work, sending money back to China to support the family. So my aunts and uncles and my father were all born in China. And eventually, grandfather went back to China and brought the whole family to the state of Washington. So my father was born in China, came over as a teenager, joined the United States Army just before the outbreak of World War II, was part of the Normandy invasion. And after the war, my dad went back to Hong Kong, met my mom, they got married, and he brought her to Seattle, Washington. I learned English in kindergarten the same time that my mom was learning English to become a United States citizen. And as I was growing up, mom and dad first had a small restaurant and later a grocery store that was open seven days a week, 14 hours a day. After school, the kids and the family uh, helped at the store. We did our homework. Our whole family stayed focused on three things, getting a good education, working hard, and taking care of each other. When I was sworn in as governor in January of 1997, I became, as Wallace said, the first Chinese American governor in US history, but also the first Asian American governor elected to the mainland. And I said in my inauguration speech that here I am moving into the governor's mansion, a very large, beautiful mansion, one mile from the house where my grandfather swept floors and washed dishes. I joke that it took our family 100 years to move one mile. 
So there was bad traffic in the state of Washington, no. But what a journey it's been. A journey of hope, hard work, faith, and belief in the American dream. But my family's story is no different than your family's stories or the stories of other Chinese and Asian Americans throughout this land. Indeed, our family's story is the story of America. All of our parents denied themselves even the smallest luxuries so that their kids could have a better life. And life certainly wasn't easy for immigrants, but they perse persevered, secure in the belief that one day they could give their children the type of opportunities they never had. The people gathered here in this room have achieved great success and have very bright futures among the young people and so many of the entrepreneurs here. At times like these, we must remember the hard sacrifices of those who came before us because we owe so much of our success to them and owe it to them to never forget where we came from. I remember shortly after I was elected governor, I went on a, my first trade mission to China. And my mom and dad and brothers and sisters all met me at the end of the trade mission in Hong Kong. And we went back to the family village in Guangdong, Toisan area of Guangdong province. My mom and dad had not been back in more than 50 years since their wedding. And the village was still like the 1800s. No running water, no toilets, an outhouse far away. No running water in the homes. And they cooked using wood kindling and maybe some coal briquettes in the back of the house. One light bulb hanging from the ceilings of every room. Now I suddenly realized why mom and dad were always sending money back to the family village to support the distant relatives because those distant relatives 50, 60 years before had pooled their money together so that my grandfather and my father and aunts and uncles could come to America. I owe my success to the contributions and the sacrifices of the entire village. We cannot forget where we came from. <clears throat> So I'd like to spend just a few minutes speaking with you t about what it means to be Chinese American today in 2018 and my hopes for the future of our community. And first I want to start with saying it sure feels a whole lot different being Chinese American today than when I was growing up. During the 1950s when I was in grade school, and so that tells you how old I am, I vividly remember a teacher who believed it was her duty to literally drive or beat the native culture out of her immigrant students. Most mornings, she'd ask us what we had for breakfast. And if we had eaten something that she thought was un-American, like rice porridge with fish and vegetables that my mother made, she would slap our hands with a ruler. The Japanese and the Filipino kids got the same treatment for the ethnic foods that they ate. To her, being an American meant rejecting the culture of our parents and grandparents. To be American meant choosing bacon and eggs over shifun or chuk. <laughs> and the real tragedy was that many of us young Asian Americans believed her and took her advice to heart. I was convinced that to be an American, to fit in, meant that my mom was supposed to look like the moms on television who bake apple pies, vacuum floors while wearing high heels and wearing a pearl necklace. <laughs> and so to conform, I felt that I had to reject the culture of my parents, a culture of which they were justifiably proud. And while my teacher tried to Americanize me, my parents were trying to pull me in the opposite direction. They didn't want me hanging out with other kids after school or playing sports or doing extracurricular activities. They wanted me home studying. And when I wasn't doing that, they wanted all of us working in the grocery store. This was the constant tension of my youth. And I'm deeply grateful to my parents for forgiving me all the ways in which I tried to reject my own heritage and cultural roots. I know I caused them a lot of pain growing up. But it took the American Civil Rights Movement to teach me that I could be both Chinese and American. I could be Chinese American. I could be myself. I could be as loyal and patriotic as anyone else and still eat with chopsticks. 
Because the strength of our nation has always come from our diversity of people, cultures, and religions. And there really doesn't have to be a tension between our ethnic heritage and our national heritage. We can celebrate Asian American or Black History Month. The Irish can proudly wave their flags on St. Patrick's Day, and the Italians can do the same on Columbus Day. But what holds us together is our love for America and our appreciation of the mainstream American values that have a lot more in common with what my parents taught me than I could ever imagine when I was growing up. The values that reject, reject extremism and division and embrace fairness and moral progress. The values of building bridges and working together across the lines of race and nationality to keep alive the constitutional promise of equality. And the values of hard work, hope, and opportunity. These are the values that have been embraced by UCA. They are the values that have allowed all of you to achieve the type of success that would justifiably make our parents and all of our ancestors proud. In doing so, we've become part of a multi-millennial history of Chinese accomplishment. We can thank the ancient Chinese for countless inventions and innovations, including the abacus and the seismograph, silk, cast iron, the compass, the clock, paper, the printing press, acupuncture, herbal medicine. And today we see the incredible impact of Chinese Americans, Chinese Americans worldwide. Chinese Americans. The beautiful art, artistry and architecture and sculpture of I.M. Pei and Maya Lin. The life-saving AIDS treatments of David Ho. The life-changing technology of Jerry Yang. The skating, athleticism of Michelle Kwan. The soaring music of Yo-Yo Ma. The high-tech companies started by so many Chinese Americans, whether born in the mainland, Taiwan, or America. We of all people should know and trumpet loudly that America is a land of immigrants. <laughs> except for the Native Americans, except for the First Peoples, the Native Americans, we in America are all foreigners whether first generation or 10th generation, whether our ancestors came here on the Mayflower from Europe, on a slave vessel from Africa, or on a ship from China. For close to 250 years, immigrants from every corner of the earth have come to America for freedom, hope, and opportunity. And wave after wave of immigrants have renewed and enriched America. The strength of America is our diversity of people, cultures, customs, languages, and perspectives of every stripe and shape. And each wave of immigrants has encountered challenges, adopting to new culture, customs, language, and a political system. Each wave of immigrants has faced discrimination, but each has made incredible progress. We now have Chinese who are leaders in business, finance, arts, academics, and government. And I never thought, with all the struggles that we had in the 1950s and the 1960s, and all the segregation in America, that I would ever see an African-American president in my lifetime. But America moves forward. <laughs> much, of what, what, much of what makes America unique is our spirit of innovation and entrepreneurship. And America remains the central location on the earth where new ideas and dreams can flourish in freedom and under a rule of law. The innovative and the technological success of America simply would not be possible without the generations after generations of immigrants who have come to our shores from every corner of the globe. You look at the great companies in Silicon Valley, virtually all of them were started by immigrants, whether from Russia, Israel, or China. Indeed, Chinese immigration has been key to the development of America. Look at the Transcontinental Railroad. It was stuck outside the mountains of the Sierra Nevadas. Had to bring in the Chinese from Guangdong Province, Toisan area, to finish that railroad. The very first engineer in Boeing's history 100 years ago was, in fact, 
a Chinese person educated at MIT. <laughs> Having been victims of the Chinese Exclusion Act that restricted Chinese immigration to America beginning in the late 1800s, but then continued well into the 1900s, and having suffered under alien land laws that prohibited foreigners from owning land. We of all people must stand up against this new wave of anti-immigrant sentiment spreading across this country. <laughs> Have we forgotten that the Japanese on the West Coast were put into barbed concentration camps during World War II because America was afraid that they were loyal to Japan? even though so many were born in America, and even though so many of the young men of Japanese ancestry were fighting for the United States Army, in fact, became the most decorated military unit in US history. Men fighting for America, dying for America, while their parents were in concentration camps behind barbed wire manned by machine guns. Asian Americans need to be front and center condemning the policies that stigmatize Muslims and exclude people of the Islamic faith from coming to America. We need to stand up against kicking out children of illegal immigrants, young people who have been here since they were babies, young people who are working and paying taxes or excelling in colleges and universities. And don't think that the debates about illegal immigration and visas don't affect the Chinese. It's not just about Latinos or illegals from Mexico or South America or just Muslim nations. Because these debates very much affect the Chinese community and all communities. If you want to talk about illegals, you think, oh, that's just a thing about the Mexicans. Wrong. 10% of illegals in this country are Chinese. We need to stand up against policies that would reduce the number of immigrants coming to America legally. There are policies in place that are restricting the number of immigrants that can even come here legally. There are policies that reduce the number of H-1B visas given out to foreign skilled workers at high tech firms, and that impacts Chinese Americans and Chinese. There are policies that require foreign graduate students to return to their native countries right after they get advanced degrees here in the United States. Instead of capturing that talent to create the new companies, and creating new jobs in America, we're kicking out the talent and allowing them to form companies and our competitors overseas. There are proposals by the President that would eliminate family reunification as a way to immigration to the United States. The very program that his wife used just a few months ago to enable her parents to immigrate to the United States, the President wants to end. And now the president has proposed that green card holders who get government benefits, whether Medicaid or food stamps, should have their green cards revoked and be deported. That's outrageous and will have a huge impact on Chinese Americans. Because we all know of Chinese who have been here in the United States for many decades working and paying taxes, but for some reason did not become a United States citizen. And if they faced hard times, let's say they were working in a restaurant, a low-wage job, and suddenly something happens and they've lost their income, they need government support, whether it's food stamps or Medicaid. Maybe a spouse has passed away and they can't support themselves and they need some government benefits. Because they are not a U.S. citizen but simply have a green card and are now requesting government benefits that they've paid for with their taxes all these years, they are now subject to deportation. As an ethnic group that understands that the beacon of America has drawn people to our shores and that immigration has powered America's progress, we must speak out against those who would turn their backs to what America stands for. The strength of America is our diversity of people, cultures, customs, languages, and perspectives. And those who refuse to recognize that are turning their backs to the history and the essence of America and don't know what it takes to truly make America great. Disparaging immigrants and other nations, refusing to take refugees from war-torn regions, and banning visitors and students
from certain countries demeans the Statue of Liberty and is simply un-American. Despite our success, achievements, and contributions to America, Chinese Americans must always insist that America lives up to its constitutional civil rights and civil liberties. Chinese Americans must never become complacent about equality, freedom, and due process. Because of our skin and our hair color, we Chinese and Asian Americans will always stand out. And just as many Americans are discriminating against Muslims, Hispanics, and foreigners, we are becoming the next targets, especially in these contentious times in the U.S.-China relationship. Already, the Trump administration is actively considering drastically reducing the number of Chinese students allowed to come here to study. And let's not forget the recent case of Sherry Chen. Sherry, you're in the room. Stand up, please. Sherry, thank you. Let's not forget her case. She's an expert in flooding who worked for the U.S. National Weather Service in the Department of Commerce, the department that I used to head up. She was arrested and handcuffed in front of her colleagues, suspected of spying for China, because what did she do? Supposedly illegally downloading data about dams from a restricted government database. Well, what was so illegal? She used a restricted password belonging to a coworker who passed it around and posted it for everyone in the office to use. But Sherry never gave any sensitive information to the Chinese government. In fact, she told the Chinese official who was interested in the topic that the information he sought was restricted and that any questions he had, he should ask her supervisors. Now, the federal prosecutors eventually dropped the case, but she did not get her job back. And a judge last spring ruled that she had been fired without justification, wrongly fired, and ordered her reinstated. But the Trump administration is fighting that order. And I'll be very honest, I'm embarrassed that she was fired by my successor, or my successor, a Democrat, allowed that to happen in the Department of Commerce. But now that she's been exonerated by a judge, there's no reason for the Trump administration to fight giving her job back. If the Trump administration were smart, they'd say, ah, that was a mistake done by the Democratic administration. I'm going to correct the wrong. We're going to reinstate her. But they won't. She needs to be reinstated right away. And then there's the case of Professor Xi, chairman of the Temple University Physics Department. He was charged by the federal government for illegally revealing to professors in China blueprints of sensitive lab equipment used in semiconductor research. And the prosecutors dropped the case when they learned that the blueprints were not of sensitive equipment, but of something Professor Xi had invented himself. Had they done their homework before the charges were filed, they would have never brought the case. Why? Because the designer of the sensitive equipment even told the FBI that the blueprints were not of his sensitive equipment. But the FBI still arrested Professor Xi. And in Silicon Valley today, we have heard of companies founded by Chinese Americans whose businesses are being hurt by a whispering campaign by competitors who tell potential customers you don't want to buy from company XYZ because it's headed up by Chinese and it might have ties to the Chinese government. All of this brings me to my concluding point. If Chinese Americans and Asian Americans are to protect our success and our constitutional rights, we need more Asian elected officials. And I am so proud that Andrew has the guts to stand up and say he wants to run for president of the United States of America. We have achieved an outsized impact in business, science, the arts, academia that greatly exceeds our numbers. But that has not yet extended to politics, to government. And of course there are exceptions. 
I'd like to proudly note that President Obama set the record in including our community in his government with three Asian American cabinet members and so many others serving in senior posts during and throughout his administration. But in Congress, state houses, and city halls across America, Asian Americans and Chinese Americans remain seriously underrepresented. Consider the fact that although Asian Americans make up 5.4% of the population, they only account for less than 3% in the United States Congress. That's a similar story in California. Asian Americans make up 16.5% of the state's population, but only 10% of the California legislature. In New York City, with a population of 12% Asian Americans, only 4% of the New York City Council are Asian American. Only in San Francisco have we reached parity, where the population of Asian Americans is 34%, and 36% of the Board of Supervisors, their city council, are Asian American, and mostly Chinese. 50 or 60 years ago, I, I, you, we could chalk this up to discrimination, but I don't think that's the case today. Too many Chinese Americans and Asian Americans continue to harbor the misguided belief that politics and government service is somehow less noble or useful than becoming a doctor, or a lawyer, an engineer, or a high-tech entrepreneur. Early in my life, that was certainly the opinion of my parents. But the fact is that if the Asian and Chinese American communities want action on the issues that we care most about. We've got to be at the table where the decisions are being made. <laughs> Having given our blood, sweat, and tears in building and defending this nation, we have every right and indeed a responsibility to be at the table setting the policies that affect our communities. And this is a message everyone in this room can help spread. We've got to help people understand the need for more talented and engaged Chinese American, Asian American elected officials. We need a new generation of Chinese Americans to make sure that we are represented, heard, and respected in the halls of power and indeed throughout American society. We need Chinese Americans who will remind all that America is a land of immigrants and that our strength as a nation comes from our diversity. It's our job, it's the job of everyone in this room to empower this new generation of Chinese and Asian American public officials. And so I thank UCA for bringing us all together, bringing us together to remember our journeys in this great nation, to focus on the issues and challenges facing Chinese Americans, and to gain insights and tools to move our community forward. Thank you, ACA, UCA, for all the great work you do on behalf of Chinese Americans all across America. Thank you very much. Hold a second. Yeah. Give a big round of applause. Shall we invite Ambassador back for our next convention? Come back next time. All right. Um, United, United Chinese Americans have decided through our very serious consideration and the debate and discussions that we would like to give the highest award of our community to our lo lovely and uh, distinguished Gary Locke, the ambassador to China, and is ambassador from our community to the larger society, always. This is, uh, says, um, um, lifetime achievement. But I look at the ambassador, he's young. <laughs> I mean, uh, except for a few, a few white hairs, I mean, he's everything else very young. Um, I don't know, this is a little bit too early, right? Uh, but. Before you know, I took the uh, privilege of uh, having this opportunity to ask you one question. Did you really use that coupon to order the coffee in Seattle in, in the International Airport? Uh, first of all, sit down everyone, sit down, sit down, sit down. 
And, and they should start the dinner service, right? They should stay. We've been here too long without dinner, so please start the dinner service. Yeah, start the dinner service. Um, yes, I tried to use a coupon. Uh, it's a, one of those prepaid coupons uh, that you buy at Starbucks. And uh, they did not accept the coupon. You know why? Because the Starbucks stores at the airports are not really run and owned by Starbucks. <laughs> It's a franchise to the, ho to the airport operators, and they don't accept those pre-purchased Starbucks coupons. But anyway, thank you. Let me just say uh, thank you very much for this award by the UCA. And, and I, I just want to say something. When I first ran for governor, so many people across America did not know me, had never heard of me, and yet they supported me. And that was so key to our success in winning the governorship of the state of Washington. And while I had many invitations from so many Chinese and Asian American organizations after I was elected to come to banquets and to receive awards, I said no to virtually every single one of them. Wow. Because I could have been spending every weekend or every week traveling the United States going to these uh, Chinese and Asian American organizations receiving awards. But then I would have been neglecting my job as governor. And I really felt that I could do more for the Asian American, Chinese American community by being an, an effective, respected governor. And if I did a really good job, and if I really did a good job, that would perhaps inspire more Asian Americans and Chinese Americans not only to run for office, but make it possible for them to win when they ran for office. So thank you all very much. Thank you. They asked me to ask a two or three questions. Oh. Just uh, two or three questions, then um, we'll be over. Do you have any questions? I bet you have. All right, from Los Angeles. <laughs> what are my plans for my future? I, I now work part-time at a law firm. And um, well, the question was, what are my plans for the future? And uh, uh, my plans are, I'm, uh, I'm working part time at a law firm as an advisor to the clients of the firms on U.S.-China and government relations, U.S. Uh, government issues, regulatory issues. I have my own consulting firm in which I have helped U.S. and Chinese companies on cross-border trade and investment. Next one there, Stephen. Uh, the question is, uh, what do I think about the U.S.-China trade war? Uh, let me say that the United States companies, the United States government, foreign businesses, foreign governments have very legitimate, real concerns, complaints about the economic and trade policies of China. But uh, using tariffs is the wrong way to approach the problem. And we're getting into a trade war. And in a trade war, there are no winners, only losers the workers and the consumers of both countries. Uh, there are many other, I think, more effective ways uh, to address the problems and the complaints and the real concerns that American companies, foreign companies have about China's trade and economic policies. But imposing tariffs is the wrong way to go. One more question. Good. Thank you very much. And, oh, no more questions. Okay, one last one there, here. <laughs> the question is, when am I going to run for president after Andrew? Well, after Andrew runs for president, I'll be way too old to run for president, so I'll, I'll leave it to him. Thank you very much. Do you want, would I like to take a picture?